Welcome to another episode of Immutable Conversations. Uh, today I have the honor to have with me one of my fellow colleagues at 47 Degrees, Noel Markham. Uh, welcome, Noel. Hi, hi. Great to be here. So he's done uh, a bunch of work in Scala, uh, doing consultancy in many different places, and also giving talks in a bunch of different Scala conferences and uh, lately, I know that he has been uh, putting together some material for some of our training courses at, at 47, specifically on one topic which I think is very interesting when you start digging into functional programming, which is uh, that you can do another kind of testing, which is called property-based testing. So uh, again, welcome, Noel. Uh, you know, can you give us a bit of an introduction of what property-based testing is, I mean, compared to what people will just call, I guess, testing in general? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I think I think the thing with, with property-based testing is is um, people, people who are new to functional programming, um, people perhaps with Scala who are newcomers, who have come from an imperative language like Scala, or, or C sharp things like that. Um, there's no there's no real equivalent for property based testing in those languages. Um, I'm sure we'll we'll talk about why that's the case. But when you start to see it, it it, it seems very different to, to other types of testing you may have already seen before. Um, it kind it it kind of sits in a parallel with with unit testing, um, but um, you you kind of flip the test on its head. As it were, so rather than rather than saying I I I I've written some code, I when I run it with these inputs, I want it to be successful, and this is what success looks like. Um, you'd say here is my function, um, and I am going to tell you the properties that I would expect to hold for this function, um, and then what will happen is the library will generate the data and use that data in your function. And ensure that those properties hold. So, if we just take a very, very quick example, um, if you imagine you were writing, say, the reverse function for a string, um, I'm sure, I'm sure most people watching this would would know how how to go about writing tests for that. I, I, I don't think there's anything particularly hard. But if we think about how this would work with, say, Properties. We, we need to think about what 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 the rules are for when when a string is reversed. Um, so, for instance, um, a nice property here is that if we if we reverse a string and then reverse it again, we would expect to have the same string. Now, just doing that on its own does not mean that your reverse function works. Maybe your function does nothing. Um, so you could even then augment this and say, I reverse it once, I get something different. I reverse it again, and I'm back to my input. And still, even with that, that doesn't mean that your your property uh, that your your implementation is correct. But it's a property that must hold. So this would then be used in conjunction with other properties, such as if you look at the the first character in a string and then reverse it, you would expect that to be the last element in the reversed string. Um, if you reverse a string, you would expect the length to not change. And so what will happen is the the library will provide the strings for you. So you don't have to care about those. And it will make sure that it works with regular strings that you would expect. And then also with an empty string or a single element string, or just a single character. Um, and then also with maybe things you might not think about straight away, um, such as Unicode or emoji or kanji or, or things like that. Uh, we just leave leave it up to the framework to provide the test data for us. So that's that's kind of a a, a quick look at what it, what it means for it to be a property. So it's it's sort of generating all this test for you by providing input. So yeah, 
yeah yeah so what, what will happen is with with these properties um the 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 library of the framework provides that string for you but it will do it more than once so it will provide probably by default somewhere between 10 and, and 100 um examples um and obviously your property should hold for for all of those and if it doesn't then some libraries, including Scala check or, or say quick check in Haskell, will then try to shrink the input that it um, caused the test to fail with to find the smallest test. So a nice example of this, like imagine if you had some function that you had to give it a list and for small, small um, numbers of elements in a list, it worked fine. But for some reason, it fails at five elements. Um, one of the tests might run it at, say, nine or ten elements, and obviously that would fail. Uh, and then it might even try, say, a binary search down from from nine to zero to kind of home in on on where that that failure is. Um, and it's really quite smart, and and it 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 works it works really really well. It's so that, very that satisfying, actually. <laughs> there is some cleverness on how the test data is is generated too. Apart from yes. you know having this property language, I guess, to describe these things, you also yeah. get these clever input generators. Yes, that's right. So the, these are these are not random. This uh, Scala check, Quick check. They're not they're not random libraries. I mean, naturally, there's there's an element of randomness within those. Um, but but it tends to bias towards the maybe maybe what people would call a corner case or or, or even a common case. So if you were dealing with integers, you might find that the kind of numbers you would expect that you'd think about more frequently would appear more. Mm. So you'd input you test with zero or one or minus one or the largest number for that type, you know, integer dot max value um, in, in the Java or Scala world or, or integer dot min. Um, I, all these kind of like almost magical numbers because uh, those tend to be where, where things might break or, or also the things that would probably get used the most. But this is a, this is a distribution. So, over time, this will run with with multiple values, um, uh, and it it will eventually probably run with the whole spectrum. But you know, you don't you don't always need to do it with everything. So uh, before we move on chatting about this, I think yeah. you've you've mentioned a couple of names of libraries which might be maybe yeah. interesting to make it more concrete. So this is you know this is a general technique, but there are specific sure. libraries in each language. Would you, what that you use, right? Yeah, yeah. So the 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 core one in in the Scala land, where where I spend most of my time, is is called Scala Check, um, which is a port of Quick Check from Haskell, which I believe is a port of Quick Check from Erlang. Um, but I I don't know enough about that to, to talk about that. But um, yeah, so um, Scala Check w was inspired by by Quick Check from Haskell. Um, which obviously deals, uh, which leans a lot on on the the type system, mm. um, which also is is very useful um, with 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 Scala. But I guess that nowadays, regardless of the language you use, I I, I would imagine you will have ports for Java or C Sharp or any any yeah. language out there. I I I mean I, I don't really I don't really spend much time in in Java, uh, and I've never I've never been a D, uh, a .NET uh, kind of guy, but um, I'm not sure actually if there's anything for Java. I'd I'd be surprised because the way the the way the language operate, um, sorry, the way the the library operates is um, it leans quite heavily on the type system and mm -hmm. a lot of the mechanics that the the language needs. Um, for instance, if you look at a nice property, so if we maybe go back to this um, example I used with reversing strings. Um, we're going to we're going to have to ask the compiler to to give us some way of producing random or arbitrary strings. Um, so these are called our arbitrary, and um, this this leans very heavily on the the implicit mechanism for for type classes mm -hmm. in in Scala and and in Haskell to say. I, I in my in my Scala check library I have um, an, an an implicit of type arbitrary for my string so it's an arbitrary of string and the compiler will summon that for my function so my function will have the keyword say for all 
mm-hmm. and that that takes a higher order function of my string to effectively a boolean. Um, and so the compiler knows that because I wrote this function with a string, it's going to have to summon an arbitrary string. Um, that kind of mechanism doesn't really exist in Java as it is right now. Um, I'm sure there are ways around this um, being, you know, if we want to be creative about it, but this comes so naturally with Scala. It, it, it just reads as it should. You know, we don't have to do any any fancy type gymnastics or, or any any funky boilerplate to make this work. It, it's just it's just there. It's interesting that actually, you know, it it's it both fits well with the fact that you are using this in your functional programming code, but that it also the implementation itself leans on all these kind of mechanisms about types. That's an, you know, an yeah. interesting interplay there. Mm. So uh, you know, I've been I've been sold to the idea. So my next question is, okay, how do I design this test? So there are books and, and, and uh, you know, ways you should write your, your unit test, you know, like cover the corner case and things like that. Yeah. So what if I want to write this kind of property? So you've, you've mentioned, for example, something about reverse. I would just, mm-hmm. you know, first, first do exactly what you said, that I reverse and then reverse again. It's the same, yeah. and I would I would call it a day. But then you say, "Hey, no," yeah. because you have all these other extra properties. So, how would you go to do write some of these okay. properties, and how do you not fail into pitfalls of actually not testing anything? Sure. So, I think um, a common question that often comes up to people who have started to use properties um, or, or are having trouble designing them is they often realize that. The tests they write are re-implementations of the algorithm they're testing. So then the question is, how do I like this? Is, this is almost a waste of time. How how do I make sure I'm not just rewriting my algorithm? Because, you know, if you then change your your application algorithm, you then have to change your test, and and that that that's, that's kind of redundant and and a bit pointless. So um, yeah. So so you need to almost take a little step sideways or backwards and and think about the best ways in order to to create tests that that gives you everything you need without re-implementing it so a nice example i have is say we wanted to write a function that that swapped two elements in a list right so you know we'd imagine it'd be like list dot swap and then maybe a couple of indices you know um a smaller number and a higher number and then conceptually it would take the element at the first index and put it in the element at the second index and vice versa. So I, I think the the implementation of that makes sense. I think if we were to write some unit tests in a kind of J unit style, well, I, I think we could. You know, we'd we'd create some stub data, um, think about all the cases, you know, what happens if your index is too big or too small, what if the numbers are the wrong way around, all those kind of things. Hmm. Um, try it with different strings. And then so if we were to think about maybe a first attempt at how this would work with with property based testing and something like Scala check is we might say generate a string because or, right. or no no sorry generate a list we'll generate a list we're, we're doing this with any list um, and then we're probably going to have to generate a couple of numbers right mm-hmm. so we need a first index and a second index but then we start to realize well actually we can't just generate any number like for a start it has to be positive and secondly for the successful case, at least, we're going to have to make sure that the value is less than or equal to the the length of the list. Yeah, it must be within so, the bounds. So all of a sudden, we've got all this all this noise and boilerplate in order to do this. And then once we've done that, we then have to say, right, I've got my string. I need to do the swap, and then make sure that the string I put in at the start matches my swap string. Which, again, is a bit. It's a bit noisy. It's a bit painful, and we've actually fallen into the trap there of re-implementing mm-hmm. our properties. So, I think we need to think about the the data that we've generated to to start with. And I find a nice rule here is rather than generating the input data for our test for our function that we're going to test, we actually want to give we want to generate everything we need in order to create that input. And that's a very subtle difference. Mm -hmm. But what we would do in this case is, I think quite a a comfortable way to do this would be, we generate three lists of type A, 
And then we also generate two single values of that same type. Right. Okay. And then straight away in our test, we construct our test input. So we've got three lists. We'll call them list one, list two, list three. And we've got two elements, element one, element two. And we're going to concatenate these all together. Mm -hmm. So we take list one. We can we prepend that onto element one. And then after that, we append that to list two. And then element two. And then list three. So we've got list, element, list. Oh, element, right. I list. see. I see what okay. you're doing there. So And now we've got hold of everything we need. And now, so that's going to be our test input. And now our test input almost comes for free. We have our list one again, but now we have element two. And then we have list two, element one, and then list three. So we, we have full control and full handle on everything we need. If we want to grab the index, well, that's the length of list one. Hmm. If we want to grab the second index, that's the length of list one plus one for the element plus the le list of, plus the length of list two. And now all we have to do is in our test, we say, well, here's my input. That was the first one we generated with elements one and two in the right place. And we make sure that what comes out represents element uh, the list where elements one and two were swapped. And that's really comfortable because now we don't need to worry about what number is generated, whether it's negative or whether it's longer than the list, you know, truncating the values, things like that. But there's also some more subtle things that happen here is that the lists that we've generated, um, sometimes those lists will be empty, right. which means also we've, we've immediately covered the case where the elements are next to each other. We've immediately covered the case where there's no other elements in the list because mm. we will get a case where all three lists that are generated are empty. So we'll be concatenating an empty list with a single element with another empty list, single element, and then we're just seeing that those swap the right way around. We're getting this for free. Like we've realised here that we've actually tested this a lot ni in a lot stronger way than than we actually probably even realised at first. You know, if, if we want to check that we're we're not on, using an off by one error, well, there's going to be times where that third list that we generate is empty, and then all of a sudden we're swapping with the last element in the list. As I said before, and as I kind of covered at the start of this, this doesn't this doesn't cover every single case, right? This what we've talked about here does not cover if our index is too large, but I think mm -hmm. that's okay. Like we'll write another property. I, th I think that's almost a separate property. Like the, what we've talked about here is like the successful case, and then we want to say, well, what you know, we we then have another property for if the indices are the wrong way around. Like maybe that's okay. Like maybe. maybe Maybe, uh, I mean, this depends on our implementation, right? Is that we might say, well, if our indices are the wrong way around, we just switch them around, right? But then we can easily understand what the property would look like in order to write that test. Um, and would that, you even... That, that, saying that, that comes down to the design of your API rather than the implementation details. See, so would you even go to play the same trick to generate, like, known wrong data that you pass to the... You know, because here you're essentially, like, generating input and output would you know are correct but in order to test the 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 rotten the not happy path so to say sure. would you even go and generate you know like generate a negative number so i know it's always wrong something like this sure yeah what why not <laughs> you know we can we can do whatever we want here and um another another thing i've i've done in the past is um say for instance we wanted to mock up some some external third party service right well, we don't need to worry about the, the the nuts and bolts but it's some kind of service that we call we give it an a and it returns us a b and so we we could effectively call it with anything we wanted you know mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like it's, it's a third party function call somewhere and we're, we're going to create that with with properties instead so what we could do is we could generate um, say tuples um, of A's and B's, mm -hmm. and then we we could just pair those up and say, well, for all of the tuples, anytime I call it with an A, I I'm going to return that B, and then that's kind of what I implement under my interface. But then I can also look through that list and say, well, there's certain values in my list that I've I've not generated. Mm -hmm. When I call it with those, you know, I I don't get a response from my service, and then we'd be making sure that. 
you know, depending on our implementation, that could return an HTTP 404, or if it's maybe returning an option, it returns a none or things like that. Um, and we, uh, the, the key here is, is that we've got full control over what we generate it with our data in the first place. So we, we, we don't even care about the logic. We're just saying, I've got a list of things here that I know are going to be in my thing that I respond with. Um, go and run the test. And that's it. Oh, that's, I mean, that's nice. And actually uh, ties with some other question because uh, from what you were mentioning at the beginning, I, I, I got the, you know, the feeling that this was mostly for sort of a very fine grained part. So we are talking about, you know, swapping or reverse. So I could imagine like a small functions, but then you move to talk about HTTP services. So, so, you know, how does property based testing play with something, you know, more than just the bare code level, like integration testing? Can you do integration testing with property based approaches and, and those kind of uh, more high level sort of higher level uh parts of your code sure yeah um absolutely like the, there's no reason why why you can't do this um this is not constrained to be a kind of almost like a, a unit testing um level type thing these are tests um i think we need to pay some consideration about the actual test um one of the things we want to make sure of is how fast these tests are to run um when it comes to integration testing i think naturally those those tests take longer to run mm -hmm. so you know if we're if we're using a property here that we're going to run it a hundred times like if it takes a minute to run our test like all of a sudden we're, we're venturing already into yeah. well i think we're well well into an unacceptable state in which to be in and similarly if any of those tests fail the data starts to shrink so while while we may only have a hundred runs of the test a failed a failed test will binary search and that could easily you know that could be thousands of tests to, to find the smallest data so i think it's, it's like anything you know, we come across in software engineering we we just need to to pay attention to everything and we need to make sure we're we're in full control over what's going on so th there's things we can do here is if we're going to look at um say testing a web service like we don't need to spin up the web server for every single iteration of our property right you know we, we start when the suite starts we start our server and then maybe we just swap in a certain implementation for for each test and mm -hmm. the, the server is just running. If we're inserting into a database, then maybe we don't want to be dropping data after every test. Maybe maybe we're okay with, say, prepending some value so that any queries come back, we're only looking at the data that we've put in. Yeah, we, we could be quite smart with, with indices to, to do that kind of thing. But we might find that as we do this, we're, we're probably going to see that this is going to expose some really quite interesting things in our in our design decisions, um, and I, I think I think that's okay because I, I think we then start to realise that w we can turn these tests around a lot quicker, um, even for integration tests, because we're paying attention to what it means to 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 check the data we want to. So I suppose this is a long way of saying you know we want to. We don't want to be setting up and tearing down full infrastructure with every property, and that doesn't come for free. Like That's something we need to think about when we write and design our tests, and then by implication, that's probably going to lead to how we design our API in the first place. If we want to swap data in and out depending on the test, presumably our API or our database or, or something is going to need a way to swap data in and out for a running service. These things are possible, but they, they often just don't come for free. I see. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, do you do you like see property-based testing taking over in the future? Like this being better known and people just saying, well, we shouldn't have been doing unit testing altogether. Uh, property-based testing is is better. Yeah, I I, I mean, I, I'd like that. <laughs> um, I, 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 I've... I don't think I've ever come across many situations where 
I think, oh, a property test wouldn't have worked here. Um, so I think, I think you know, making sure making sure that more people know and understand how to write property based tests goes a long way. Um, I, I'm not saying that unit testing is redundant or a waste of time. Um, I mean, obviously, every every test is better than not having a test in the first mm. place. But one one thing I I I've often done myself is is I'd often keep a, a suite of of unit tests that are based on failed inputs. So if I have a, a tricky corner case that the property-based test has found, mm-hmm. you know, certain inputs or certain date stamps, I, I don't know, some something that that caused a really interesting corner case is that I will extract those inputs and create a test for them. And then my CI and my build is going to run with those inputs every time. Because of the nature of property-based testing, things can be random, and sometimes not everything gets tested, um, which is a bit bit uncomfortable sometimes. But the things that I'm really, really, really want to make sure that mm-hmm. get tested every time, I'm probably going to write those in a unit test. I'd, I think that's the exception rather than the rule, though. Um, but still, still, the, the data is sort of coming from this shrinking process. We just want to ensure that this data yeah. is tested regardless. Yeah, yeah, and there there are ways to fix this. Um, I know that there are some libraries out there that that say fix the the random seed um, so that it run. You know, you can then reproduce those test runs yourself. I, I'm not a fan of those myself because I, I think you're kind of then you're losing the randomness then, and you're just mm-hmm. making sure that it fits within your suite. But those values that caused failures, I think sometimes they're worth capturing. Um, yeah. Cool. So, well, that was a lot to be learned here. So, well, thanks, Noel, for uh, taking your time to explain all of this. Um, yeah. Well, I hope we'll, we'll, we'll uh, you know, see you around in in conferences soon, hopefully uh, in person. <laughs> hopefully, in, hopefully in person, yeah. Be good to get yeah. good to get out there again and get on some airplanes, I think. It'd be good fun. <laughs> Cool. Well, once again, thanks very much. Cool, thanks. Mm-hmm.